Well, it's a great privilege to be joined today by Jim McNeish. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Pleasure. I'm in good shape, actually. Yeah, I'm really quite enjoying this time. If it wasn't for this filthy disease, it would be a golden time. Yes, and, w- and where are you uh, coming from today? Where are you? I am in Stirlingshire. So I am... Come on, show us the beautiful view. Oh, that's, that, that's where I am at the moment, just uh, looking out my window and enjoying the Garganic Hills. Um, and we had the most spectacular sunset yesterday. Um, so that's all over my uh, <laughs> Instagram, as you might imagine. That's beautiful. Yeah. I just I love it. Some of the photos that Jim puts up on his Instagram of the landscape and, and it's just absolutely stunning. If if you if you wanna if you wanna get um home envy, go go to the <laughs> Instagram page. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I'm I'm glad you've had a, you've got a beautiful setting to enjoy lockdown. Um, but my first question, Jim, is uh, before we find out a little bit about you, uh, what's your observation of of what lockdowns? been like generally particularly in your world as a leadership consultant christian um what would you say your general observations have been um i gave me two halves really it started horrifically with you know my business folding and um me breaking out in psoriasis with anxiety and uh guilt and and stuff about kind of doing away with the business so that was horrific. And I really required the people closest to me in my life to help me through that and really push me into making the decisions. I, I don't know if I was um, adequate on my own for that whole thing. So um, brother and sister-in-law were amazing, closest friends, really just kind of pushed me through it. And I, I've never faced an issue like that in my life. I'm pretty independent, and um, but I, I certainly needed that strength. And then there was like a three-day hiatus like so the diaries were empty for about a month and then and then there was this three day hiatus after everybody had gone and um the diaries just filled right back up again and and got incredibly busy and then i discovered online life by just saying yes to a guy called nathan finocchio who wanted to do interviews just starting to say yeah. yes i'd always avoided the online world and i said so okay and um all of a sudden it was just like this avalanche of kind of rolling over and um suddenly we've got podcasts that are in number 12 in the iTunes charts we've got um and that's Kirsty Mack and I and then we had uh, the webinar that we did was just amazing in terms of the take up and and I'm just really busy with clients and doing a lot of writing and it's it's just a tremendous peaceful reflective time now mm. and you're so humble you, you wouldn't verbalize this so candidly but but you are in the Christian world, I would say the most in-demand coach, um, leadership consultant, everyone's after you. You've, you've trained so many influential leaders, global leaders, uh, but obviously you didn't start where you are now. Could you just rewind the clock a little bit and share a little bit about your story and how you got into what you do now? It's interesting you say that though, first of all, because I, I don't see myself as a coach in the Christian world. Mm. It's like all my work and kind of success and ambition and aspiration has always been in the commercial world. Yeah. Um, And I really just do things for mates in the Christian world. You know, like if I know them and they're running a church and they want a hand, I do. And I I never charge. Like I always, that's always my kind of um, giveaway work. Um, I've only really started to engage with the church commercially since I've started to run these webinars and, and they're now affordable by people in the church. Mm. Um, but I think up until then, it's always just been like, you know, my mate, it's, uh, I mean, the stuff I do with um, the Archbishop of Canterbury and, and the bishops, that's a bit more commercial and a bit more kind of focused on a, on an outcome. Um, but um, yeah, I've never seen it that way, but it, it, fascinating that you say, so that strikes me as, wow, i would never really thought about it that way. Um, yeah. In terms of how it all started, I, um did my degree at Edinburgh University. I did a biological sciences degree, but I specialised in psychology. Um, I joined um, BP in, and I got put in one of their fast track schemes and they spent like a vast sum of money every year on my education. 
Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, whenever there was a group of guys sat around crying that the dads didn't love them enough, I'd been in the middle getting a certificate for it. So uh, things like, you know, um, <laughs> you know, all the, hu- all the human potential stuff, all the dodgy stuff that people in the church are kind of like, oh, you know, be careful, new age, new age. So I, I was getting all qualified and all of that. And it's somewhere between psychology and philosophy. It's like existential psychotherapy and different offshoots of, um, gestalt, transactional analysis, coaching. So I was doing programs that were mixed up in all of that. Mm. And then um, I was uh, headhunted by um, a maniac called Anita Roddick. And so I went in and I was her um, leadership development guy. And then my boss at the time, she resigned and I became the head of global learning and development body shop globally. At that time, I also began to lecture and teach at Schulich School of Business in Toronto on sustainable and ethical business under David Wheeler's seat. Um, And then I became the uh, head of executive development for the Kingfisher Group. And um, that's kind of the, that was my corporate career. Um, Gave that up, had a crack at consultancy, it worked out well. Turns out you don't have to sell yourself, you just have to tell people what you do and, and and if they want it they'll they'll ask you um took all my money bought an old hotel in the banks of Lochte, established an executive development center called Cantal, refurbished it was invited to do a phd at edinburgh university kind of sold Cantal, had a had a look at that decided actually and it was on bioenergetics the body-based psychotherapy work and um, they really wanted me to do the empirical investigation on that could we actually find the correlation statistically and so I started putting that together, felt like we could have found some really interesting stuff, but really didn't want to devote three years of my life to bioenergetics. I think it's a useful study, but it's not the truth. It's just kind of helpful. And um, came out here, established Quake as a consultancy and as a community, and then that got disbanded at the beginning of COVID-19, and we'll see where we all stand at the end of it. So that was kind of the journey. Amazing. Just to target, you mentioned bioenergetics a couple of times it'd be great some of our viewers won't have a clue what that is i'm probably being unfair asking you to try and unpack hours of teaching in a couple of minutes but could you share what bioenergetics is and then once you've shared it would you say then that bioenergetics is a window through which we get um insight as opposed to a model by which every time we look at a person we're working out whether they're a type one two three four or five (laughs) yeah and bioenergetics is Reichian psychology. It's, it's body-based. So Wilhelm Reich was the really the orchestrator and, and originator of, of thinking about the body and the mind being one system. Mm-hmm. And he, he went a bit crazy at the end, but he absolutely was a genius and, and he was a pioneer. And then he also was a therapist to a man called Alexander Lohan. And Alexander Lohan's work with Reich was breakthrough for him and he began to study and he pulled together a lot of strands from Melanie Klein and Freudian kind of stages of development and uh, Carl Jung's archetypes. <clears throat> and eventually we put together this thing called bioenergetics and the essence of it is this, is that there are five stages of child development and at each of those stages the child faces a particular emotional challenge. They go through a right, a level of growth. So for instance, stage one, the only part of the limbic brain that's really up and functioning is is the amygdala. And so therefore the child is particularly prone to uh, shock or a a threat or attack or those things. Um, In a normal kind of childhood, a parent would help the child soothe back to a relaxed state if they are provoked in such a way. Um, Because the child can't do it on their own. They require that parental soothing. If the parental soothing is inadequate to the child, the child decides it's inadequate or um, it's absent or it's kind of just, you know, not fully energized. Um, the child can have to take matters into their own hands in a sense. And, and because they're overwhelmed by a specific emotion, they have to block it and say, I, I can't be with all this terror or I can't be with this abandonment or I can't be with this humiliation. Um, and I don't have a parent soothing me back into that, kind of rational, restful state. So I'm going to have to block it from actually happening in me. And I'm also going to have to get an act together psychologically to deal with these circumstances. And that kind of interplay between the physical blocking and the psychological act 
is the formation that it starts to be that that's how the child sees the world and so they have a number of reactions like that and it becomes repetitive which eventually starts to form a particular muscular armory as well as a way an ingrained way of starting to see the world and so these five stages produce five archetypal types of personality and we tend to be a mixture of one or two of them depending on what happened to us in childhood so that's the very mechanistic cause and effect we have described of what is a much more um, organic and chaotic uh, system but that's the the basic theory giving you five types of personality all of them with a kind of unique muscular holding pattern and we usually demonstrate a couple of them uh, as part of our core personality so good you did that, that was record time as well because i've sat through <laughs> teachings where where it's you know two to three hours of going through each one well yeah that's amazing that you you've you've done that um so so would you say you know we look at these personality tests we look at things like myers-briggs that we're looking at talking about bioenergetics um would you say they're pretty accurate in terms of their diagnosis or would you say they they're just a window or, or do they limit us to start looking at people in a certain way so bernadette and i um, once we got the language about the different types we'd walk around and she'd go you're a type one. Oh, that's type two behavior oh that's type five and it was so accurate i mean so so for for viewers that don't know type one oftentimes um quite a skinny frame quite sharp features and very focused and obsessed in a particular um skill to give them a, a degree and a dimension of security and i i was like that is me <laughs> so so i think it's very accurate but how do we make sure we don't start going around looking at people like type three behavior i know you're getting yeah <laughs> and that's always been my hatred of the model mm. you know i think um I remember talking to a mentor of mine, a man called Robert Diltz, we were on a flight together and I said to him, I just hate it. <laughs> he was like, you know, really? Because you've done a lot of work on it. And I was like, yeah. I said, um, but you know, quite often you'll leave an organization and, and what you've left behind is a bunch of people <laughs> basically writing off all the relational difficulties as a character flaw in the other person. You know, and uh, it's like, oh, that's because they're a big type three and everybody says it, you know, and, and so you start to gather evidence and before you know, you've scapegoated all your shadow in some poor individual because you went on a two day training program that helps you put seven and a half billion people into five boxes, <laughs> you know, and so there's an element of that was like, oh, you know, give us a break. Um, and, and also... You know, still, if you go into IPIP, the kind of the um, statistical um, sort of knowledge base for all psychometrics, um, there still really is only the five, the big five that have any form of statistical reliability, like openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism mm -hmm. are the only five kind of traits that have any form of sustainable kind of statistical reliability through folks lives so your, your Myers-Briggs and your bioenergetics and Cattell's 16PF and Fido B and Insight and DISC there are tremendous distinctions about the human condition that can help you become incredibly articulate and help you notice things about people but not I would say good diagnostic tools not a good tool to kind of name or box or put somebody in it because there's nothing more hateful like I was having a, a conversation with somebody the other day about theology and I was just chatting to them a little bit about uh, where I was coming from. And they said, oh, hey, sorry, Jim, you've just revealed yourself as an ex jenner by saying all that stuff. I said, don't you dare, don't you dare in some way put me in a box to then listen to all my answers through so that you can somehow in isolated superiority just make a judgment call on this conversation. <laughs> it's like I'm a lot, you know, yeah, I've, I've got X gen tendencies, but like most of my assistants would say I'm kind of the Y gen in the relationship. It's trying to pull me into lines of difficulty, <laughs> you know? So I, I think with these things, they are phenomenal stories. And there's a great Hebraic, ancient Hebraic saying that asks the question, what's truer than the truth? And the answer is the story. And it's the story we tell ourselves, the way that we can construct something and make it make sense. And so you can use these stories, if you hold them lightly and hold them, don't make them 
replace your experiential reality, but hold them lightly, allow it to inform it, uh, bring some of the distinctions that sit underneath it, then you can start to tell stories and put together stories that allow healing to occur in people and completion to occur car and insight and transcendence above their issues all of that becomes incredibly possible by the power of our words when we have more and more distinctions about the human condition mm. but that's different to, to making it the truth when you make it the truth then you basically start cutting all the untidy ends of your experience to make it fit these models and then when you do that to someone it is actually positively hateful wow and I mean, you've said that we shouldn't, well, essentially we should take responsibility for, for our relationships, but, but you mentioned the shadow self or the shadow side. What, what is that? Cause that's a real key tenant in your, in your teaching. It's a great model and a great, gives great language to, to every individual's experience. So, so what is that? Yeah, that's a lot of what I'm teaching on at the moment. I tend to go through these phases, these chapters, and I used to have clients that I worked with over sort of 20 years, and they were able to say to me, you're really into this just now, aren't you? Because it keeps coming up in our coaching. So um, it's like I have to own my own kind of uh, projection on reality, but shadow is certainly a big part. It always has been, but like recently, it's been more and more in demand. And I think it is important. I think... In fact, I think it's the most important thing you can do as a leader is to do the work on your shadow. And, and the shadow, if we use Jack Sanford's way of kind of getting into it, is we have an ego and it has strengths and it has weaknesses. But what we do is we draw our own line through it into what is presentable and what is not in our society. And particularly if you're a leader and you see yourself as a charismatic leader, you're prone to this. And particularly if you're religious, yeah. you're prone to it as well and so what we do is we create something called an idealized ego image which is this is how i want to be seen in the world and um uh that becomes our pride position and that's where we just uh show the best parts of our character and our nature but the minute you dualize the world into having a pride position you automatically create a shame position and there's parts of your personality that you say, ah, 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 you, you don't get to be seen, or I'm not, I'm not got you worked out yet, or actually you've got a bit of shame attached to you. And it goes into a, a sack called the shadow, where we repress and neglect and try and ignore it. Problem is, these parts of our personality still have energy, they still have a pulse. And so they're still beating away and they're leaking negativity into our lives. And if we take something which is alive in us and practically ignore it and, and shove it away, it acts as an invisible rudder on our life and we call it fate. Mm -hmm. And it affects our relationships subconsciously, it affects our health subconsciously, it affects those two o'clock in the morning kind of terror jolts. That it does all of those things and the real the real work of a leader is, can we start to pull those things back out the sack again and find out what use they were meant to be in our life, what they were meant to provide for us, um, and get them reintegrated back into our personality again? Well, do you find that's quite difficult? Let, let's stick with Christian leaders for now. Do you think that's quite difficult for a Christian leader to almost surrender their own agenda and be like, okay, I'm going to do the necessary work and invest the necessary time to really dig underneath the surface and deal with this stuff. Cause, cause if you've been a pastor or minister, let's say for 30 years, 40 years, you're bound to have some stuff yeah. and some complex issues that you've suppressed. Absolutely. It is difficult. And it is difficult because, um, I think it was Tolstoy that, had the quote that says it's very difficult to change a man's mind when he's preached something publicly from the platform. That's so good. And, um, and so therefore you are really motivated to defend your public commentary and you start to build a belief system and a, a stuff around it. And so you'll, you'll wave scripture over the top, like as far as East is from the West and I'm a new creation and, 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 and a whole bunch of those things, which, 
do you know, I'm, I'm prone to, like in my darkest moments, I'll go there, you know, and it helps. It's like, I, I, you know, that's, that's, I cry out in a very childlike faith when I need it. Um, and so I think there's truth in those things. Mm. But if we make it our entire truth and we start to go into levels of denial where we know we're in denial and where we know we still have repeating patterns that aren't getting sorted out um, and they cause us unhappiness or they cause us hiddenness or they cause us um, unrest, then it's, we, we need to have a look at them. And, and here's, here's the beauty of it, though, is Carl Jung, the orchestrator of this whole archetype, says... 90% of the shadow is pure gold. Like it's just, it's tremendous stuff. And we made it wrong. We made it wrong. We looked at it in such a way that we shamed it and corrupted it. Observation is not inert. It's not inert in quantum physics and it's certainly not inert in psychology and in relationships. If somebody looks at you encouragingly and lovingly, you can feel it. If somebody looks at you judgmentally, a little bit of you kind of withdraws inside. You can kind of get that sense of it. Alan Watts says, perception without love is a sin. And actually learning how to observe those parts of ourselves again with a sense of hope and faith and their ability to go through some type of restoration and um, uh, that reconciliation and, and, and bringing them back into what they're meant to be is so important. But also from a, also from a, a faith-based point of view is bringing them into the light with God is one of the most profound faith-based things you can do. Um, way back in the 1800s, I'm not going to get this quote entirely right, but St. John of Kronstadt has a quote and um, it's along the lines of when you are alone and despairing and in your despondency, you kneel to pray. Remember now as always that the Trinity looks upon you with eyes brighter than the sun. Beautiful. And the idea of being observed by your creator means that there is a space there to actually start to say, well, here's the bits of me that feel like they are corrupted or I'm struggling with them or they affect relationships negatively or they make me anxious. Mm. And if we can do that work on ourselves, if we can be prepared to bring these things a bit more into the light in a safe and in a, a, a um, in some kind of process, then it can make all the difference. So I think it's Dr. Caroline Lee. She, she has this concept about encouraging us to go into Gethsemane and to really wrestle with the flesh and, and our will and what we want. Practically speaking, if there's a pastor watching this and I'm sure there'll be a few, what can they do? To, to go into the garden, so to speak, and, and look at this shadow self? Like, should, should they go on a retreat? Should they get a coach? Should they see a counsellor? Like, like, what should they do to get this started? Any of those things, or if they're married, they'll be going through that process anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, like that intimacy with another person will always elicit shadow. And it's usually that's the person that sees your worst side, your rage, your... You know, they get it all. And it's because that's the person that you feel safest with and that you're most whole with. So a lot of people try and hide their marriages if they're a little bit irascible or, or, or struggling or, or, or there's a bit of uh, anger in them. And it's kind of like, actually, it's probably because you've decided that that's the safest place for you both to be all of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think any of those things are good I remember um, watching Louisa von Franz uh, Marie Louise von Franz, sorry who was kind of um, Jung's greatest prodigy really she was amazing and um, she talked a little bit about you'll never get near the shadow right in the beginning of her uh, interviews you know you'll always need to go through an analysis and, and then towards the end she was like nah do you know what if you're in any form of intimate friendship or relationship the shadow is going to get stirred up. And it, and it is about how do you go in there with just a little bit of faith. And it, and it could be that getting a coach to support you would be useful. It could be that a retreat is really helpful as well. But I think the framework for it, which is you're not walking through some kind of hell. You're actually going looking for treasure. You know, you're, you're in there curious about that thing that you've made shameful your entire life. You know, if God didn't screw up when he made you, 
then what was its original intention before it got corrupted by this world? What was it meant to do as a contribution? Or how does it balance other parts of my life which can get out of balance? And if this is there and I can be with this, it actually brings me back to that wholeness. And so therefore it's almost like engaging with it in faith mm -hmm. that actually there is something good that can come out of this. There is something that it can and work with. And also I think Our churches can be amazing and they can also be a place of quite hollow togetherness. Mm. You know, where there's a bunch of people running around with some received beliefs and a, 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 a list of virtue signals that they've got that they can kind of rhyme off at any moment to be acceptable. And, and so we can get that. And when that happens, that's hard to be with. Um, and that's because they're not kind of ha tackling the shadow because um, uh, Jack Sanford's mentor says, um, you know, in a, a showdown between the shadow and the ego, God favors the shadow every time. Wow. You know, it's, um, it's that idea of it's Fritz Kunkel. It, it basically says, um, the shadows where our energy is, it's where a lot of our trapped life is. Mm -hmm. And that that's the journey. That's the, this religious, this is this cross. This is these thorns in our flesh. These are these things that um, to get the planks out of our eyes, to see through the glass a little clearer. Um, that's the journey of this life, which is an ongoing sanctification process, an ongoing wholeness, holiness, wholeness. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea of becoming increasingly whole. And it does mean that we start to create a redemptive agenda for all the parts of ourselves and we learn how to do it, but, but don't make your whole life about that. Yeah. I love that you mentioned the phrase, the journey, because, because when we had an initial call, I think last week, you really unlocked, you coached me through something and that was this belief, erroneous belief system that I need to work through some of my stuff and once i've worked through my stuff then more influence will come or then more opportunities and actually you were saying to me you know no now there is only now there is there is no there because when you get there it's your now so so like could you just unpack yeah what you coached me through just just share with our viewers what what you shared with me really it was gold but just it's a practice it's an ongoing everyday practice if if it's basically jam tomorrow which is once i'm this level then i can move on and do this and then when i'm that level i can move on and do that that's going to get you into a bit of trouble because for every new piece of knowing you come into you also create another bit of shadow you know whatever you're choosing to notice now then there's a bit of shadow being created in order to notice that and in order to be that thing and so Part of, the, part of the religious faith experience has to be dealing with that aspect of our character on a regular basis, mm. um, as opposed to some kind of arriving. You know, it's, it's to keep pushing on, it's to keep moving forward. Um, I, I have a practice where now when I do communion, I used to do communion like a good old apostolic and I would do a list of my sins for the week and apologize for them all and take the wine and take the bread. And um, I decided I would change that a couple of years ago. And what I now do is I kind, I kind of disengage with the worship about 10 minutes before we break bread. And I, um, I sit back and I, I had a realization that my faith, I think, has a unique ability, the Christian faith, to deal with shadow. It's all there, like right at the core of it is the sacrifice, right at the core of it is the cross. And it's the cross, I think, is the power of the Christian faith. And it's that space where we come and that's where I usually just pray to God, search me. I take 10 minutes out to say, search me. What is it I am doing that is corrupting or perverting society or relationships around about me or friendships or, or close folks what, what part am i playing and where am i projecting all my own stuff out there you know um putting demons of my own construction on other people and, and and those things it's like 
can I just pull that back and own it? And can I do it ironically in the shadow of the cross? Can I do it in that space where, you know, my humanity meets the provision? And, um, and so therefore, I do it for about 10 or 15 minutes twice a month. I kind of just look, do a bit of examination on myself. And I've just found it incredibly liberating and freeing. And occasionally there might be something I want to talk to something about, somebody about. But mostly I kind of know what it is. And I know what's going on. And so I can deal with it there. Um, and I'm less willing, therefore, to blame Trump or Boris Johnson or other yeah. people who become our scapegoats for yeah. the thing that's going on inside of us. I love that. That's so Christocentric. And it leads lovely, like brilliantly into my next question about pneumatology, because I was going to ask, what's the bat? So you might have a pastor watching this and they open up the altar call or ministry time and the spirits moving, whatever language you want to use, ministering to his people. Oftentimes in that moment, someone will have a breakthrough or someone will be deeply um, touched and there'll be tears and there'll be a lot of emotional junk coming out. But pastors aren't trained counselors. So, so what's the balance of us opening stuff up in that moment and then sending people off home and they've opened up a whole load of stuff, but then they've got nowhere to process that. What's the role of the spirit in that? And I mean, your practice of getting before the cross in communion, I think is a great template and practice for people to practice themselves. But in the church setting, what would you suggest to ministers in terms of walking them through what's potentially been opened up? I'd say that I'd want to make sure that their church had a balance of openness to the Holy Spirit as well as down-to-earth relational community. You know, I think, when I think of the culture in Scotland, for instance, I keep coming back to Scotland because there's a down-to-earthness with it. And I, I feel like the culture here takes care of quite a lot of my, my stuff. You know, it's like, if I get too above myself or too prideful of that, there's somebody will take the legs from me and, and, and point that out. And, and usually with a sense of humor and usually with a warning shot that says, hey, watch yourself, you know. And, um, and then also, if you're too down on yourself or too low, there'll be people that gather you up and take you out for a drink and, um, or a movie or something like that. There's a, there's a relational cultural piece. There's a church in Littlehampton, um, pastors, a woman called Becca Jupp. And... Um, the Thatcher clan, her dad's before her and stuff, I always felt they had this phenomenal balance of um, presence of the Holy Spirit. So there are times we would talk about the crazies getting their hands on the meeting and suddenly it would be prophetic and rap and we were in the middle of the chopping, chopping down trees of religion and stuff like that in the middle of the, the hall. And, and I'd be embarrassed because I had visitors, you know, and all that stuff. But there was just a real space for the miraculous to occur and the supernatural and the, that deep healing. Um, and there were real down to earth barbecues and chats and fallouts and making it up again. And kind of because there was a family at the core of all of this church. And I think for me, that's the balance is that a lot of things um, would be, maybe we have a big, spiritual kind of intervention and we're going to kind of do something to people and then there's something opened up and then the response is well we need to now get them specialized coaching and counseling and those things but what about if the two merged to each other just that little bit more where absolutely some stuff kind of gets opened up but then there's a cup of tea afterwards and a chat and some joking and then you know that there's going to be people for a coffee with and then another chat and then if you're getting out of line with something or you're over worrying it somebody will say oh come on pull yourself together or or, or um, you know, you're doing okay, or hey, let me help you with this. And then it becomes increasingly the very, very small number that then need that specialized coaching or therapy or those things, because largely that ebb and flow of both take care of all of it. Um, and then there'll still be people missed, there'll still be imperfection, and there'll still be a need for specialists, but maybe less and less. And also maybe we'll become less touchy and less scared of intervening in one another's lives wow so powerful you you've obviously interacted with i'm not going to say hundreds or thousands that it'll be a, a, around that both in the corporate world and in the christian world 
engage with leaders. Um, what would you say the standout traits are between a, a good, healthy leader and a, and a great, healthy leader? Like, like, what are some of the key characteristics? Kindness. Kindness. I was not expecting you to say that. I, th- I thought you were going to say, um, actually, I don't know. I, that, unpack that. That's, a, that's, that's taking me by surprise. The greatest leaders I know are good at their, whatever their organization is they're leading in. They've got details. They know it. If it's commercial, they've got great commercial expertise. If it's church, they've got a phenomenally robust theological approach that is both organic and changeable, but also pretty trustworthy. And they have the human skills and they have organizational skills and they have all of those things that we would train, teach and work with them. But the ones I've noticed who I think are just exceptional are the ones who have preserved a part of their brain to retain kindness. And in all their busyness and their stress and in their power, um, they will still reach in and occasionally break the rules in service of the heart. Um, Occasionally just offer unmerited favor. Occasionally just help somebody up. Occasionally just let somebody off the hook. Um, And occasionally just bring a really, really nice word. And they do it wisely. And I think it's their access to wisdom is that they have all of that other stuff going on but they have wisely learned that if they can flavor it with kindness, then their life will go much more smoothly and, and, uh, and gently, and they will have um, less of a violent impact on other people as they're moving their organization forward. Wow. Gosh, that's going to be a game changer for somebody. For me, maybe. <laughs> now, penultimate question, Jim. You mentioned wisdom there, and my question was going to be around knowledge but but let's bring in wisdom let's talk about knowledge and wisdom how have you, how do you continually cultivate an appetite for learning and just a couple of practical ways in which you intentionally make sure you're learning all the time because i guess with psychology and with leadership studies something new is coming out all the time and you're not only trying to um be exposed to the models that are out there but trying to develop your own ones as well so, so kind of pull back the curtain a bit and tell us how you, how you go about doing that? I have people in my life who will sharpen me. You know, Kirsty Mack is a wonderful kind of co-coach. Kirsty also doesn't come from my Christian tradition in the same way. And so I love having her kind of catch me from lazy talk, you know, like, you know, jargon, throwaway stuff. And that's, so that's, that keeps me, me good. Um, I do read a lot. I, I love a story. <clears throat> So <clears throat> I'm really into stranger things at the moment. And then it was Homeland before that. And I do like a good, a bo- a good book on the go. I like Umberto Eco and um, some of these uh, uh, Hilary Mantle and stuff. I love a, a narrative, a story. And, um, and, and I can usually see deeper patterns in it. Like anytime I go and see a good movie, I come out deeply inspired to want to write more behavioral leadership programs and stuff because of, I've seen something else in it. Yeah. Um, so, so that would always keep me fresh and sharp. Um, and then I'll, I'll get somebody who's being a bit controversial and I'll have a look at it and I'll keep an open mind. So I, I really liked Paul Bloom having a real go at um, empathy in his uh, last book. And um, uh, it, was, it was phenomenal, it was compelling, uh, this idea that empathy is, is largely damaging in society. Um, it's really good for a relationship between a couple or a father and son or your kind of core group. But, you know, wider than that, it causes, you're more likely to empathize with people who are most like you. And so therefore it tends to create tribalism and therefore exclusion. Um, And so therefore, how do you employ rational compassion, which is more numerate, data-led and fair in terms of how you run larger organizations and make it work? I thought, what a brilliant thought. A really, really good thought. And so I will pick up, I read um, Patricia Churchland's book on conscience just recently and about kind of the evolutionary argument for conscience and why warm-blooded animals stuck together in the way that we do and and why we would protect our young and Mm. and, uh, therefore, you know, 
all those things. So I, I would, I would, um, I, I'm quite nerdy uh, with that stuff, and and I like, I like, and I'm introvert. I'm off the scale introvert. Um, uh, even though it's not a statistically resilient uh, uh, personality trait, and it isn't actually. I'm sometimes extrovert, um, but the um, I do like my space and my time to kind of do that reading, and then and, and also I'm a little bit of a show off. But not to like a large group. So like my poor assistant, I'll run through and I'll say, "See what I've just done," <laughs> and I'll show them the latest thing. And there is only one response I want, which is, "That's amazing. That's highly insightful. That's great." I just, went, "Well, thanks," you know. And like, um, and uh, I'll come away back. And so I, I learn through um, showing off what I think is a new insight, and I test it with others and stuff. And I always get my best learning when I hit up against a more kind of warrior archetype that'll say. Oh, it's been done, or that's nonsense. Um, and uh, so I, those are kind of my processes. They're very organic, but it's a mixture of all of those things. Well, it's working anyway. That is that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, final question, Jim. I mean, people have been fortunate enough to have 40 minutes of listening to you, but, but if someone had the opportunity to sit across the table from you and uh, glean from you, they tell you their story, you'd listen. But, but if you could kind of um, lead the conversation with one theme or one topic that you thought would really be a game changer for them and their lives. What would that theme be and what would you say? It would be discovering your passion. And um, because if you discover your passion, um, the ego, our five personality styles, our Myers-Briggs thing, or um, Enneagram, various things. These are our conscious thing that are on the, things that are on the surface and our personalities are our, our, our seeable character. They're designed to defend us and protect us. You know, the type one becomes up in their head smart to defend against danger and become vigilant. The type two becomes charming so that they don't get abandoned. The type three powerful so they don't get humiliated. The type for supportive and helpful nice so they don't get made wrong and guilty and the type five successful and outcome orientated so they don't fail and get rejected the ego is a construct designed to stop us from suffering but if you take the time to find your passion in other words the word passion is derived passio which is to suffer if you find what you're prepared to put yourself on the line for mm. and you are prepared to suffer for then you will tackle your shadow you will go through emotional discomfort you will be prepared to um face into the bits of yourself that don't feel good and go through seasons which are a bit difficult because your heart's beating for something deeper and so if you find your passion and here's what i'm really living for then you just won't see your shadow in your way you know you'll you'll tackle it you'll you'll start to kind of get after it because there's something more important that you're living for. And you won't live your life in fear either because the definition of fear is the anticipation of future suffering. And if you've already made peace with the fact that here is something I'm prepared to endure for, something I'm prepared to put myself on the line for. And it isn't about horrible, nasty stuff. It's maybe about having a kid and saying, I'm prepared to really put myself out as a dad so that this little being's character develops into a wonderful contribution to the world. And that means there's going to be some sleepless nights. And that means as a teenager, there's going to be difficult conversations and she's going to drive me crazy. You know, it's going to be all those things. But you know what? I'm passionate about being a dad. And so I embrace that stuff. And therefore, I will confront my own shadow in those. I will stop my rackets. I will, will not give over to being a personality type and fit those boxes. I will moment to moment live out of what it is I am here to contribute to this world. And I think if you can get a hold of that in someone, you can absolutely set a leader on fire. Wow. Gold. Jim, thank you so much. Pleasure. Um, how can people follow your, your work and uh, your social media platforms? They will all appear in the bottom of the screen now, but, but how can people find you? Sure. The platform should be up and running, I think, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, we're going to have niche.co, N-E-I-S-H.co um, running. Um, I'm going to be doing a, a webinar on Shadow in 
July, starting on the twenty first, and we've kept it at, we've kept it away from being corporate rates. So it's like fifty quid a module. There's three modules, and um, people can come on it. They can learn about how to do some things with your shadow, but also things like rackets and those are quite funny. You know, like some of the subtle shadow things we do. How do you tackle it? Um, and um, we have a podcast, Kirsty Mack and I call called Leaders What Now on Spotify and on um, iTunes. And there's no charge for those. Just go on and download them. There's 18 of them as of Tuesday. There's going to be them. Um, and um, and then I'm occasionally on with Nathan Finocchio on a Friday night. It won't be tonight, but next week I will be. Um, and then other people like John Mark McMillan, yourself and, and others, I'm, I'm happy to kind of sit and have a chat to and opine um, you know, I'm, I'm no stranger to my own opinion, so um, there's plenty of opportunity for that going on out there. Um, so yeah, there's there's loads of ways that they can do it. And if they want to find out any information, then write into MDS. Um, that's Mark Street's um, email, MDS at niche.co. Um, you can get more information on any of these things. Amazing, Jim. Thank you. You're great. That was so much wisdom there. Uh, I hope you um, enjoy what's left of lockdown and then and yeah. then look forward to hearing everything you're up to um, going to be up to once, once you're out and about again thanks Rob good to meet you and good to spend the time chatting yeah speak to you bye take care bye bye